Welcome, Troy. I'm so glad we can do this interview today. Yeah, well, thank you for uh, thank you for having me. I I appreciate the opportunity to uh, to be on your podcast. And um, there's not a lot of people in the intersection we're in, uh, so it's really great to to meet and talk to a fellow traveler and maybe reach an audience of other people kind of like us. Exactly, exactly. And um, I mean, before we dive into the Bitcoin's role in climate. Uh, change debate. We, I, I, I'd like to know, let the audience know um, who you are, what you did before Bitcoin, and maybe you can explain it uh, in a short, uh, yeah, in a short way. Yeah. Well, I, I am an academic philosopher. That's my profession or trade, <laughs> um, and I've taught at a number of uh, universities uh, uh, in in the U.S. and in Europe, and. Right now, I'm teaching at a small liberal arts college in the Pacific Northwest, Reed College, which I really love and enjoy. I do contemporary analytic epistemology and metaphysics, uh, mm -hmm. not exactly related to Bitcoin, but everything is kind of related to Bitcoin in some way or other. Uh, so that's my background and training. Um, I, I, I've been an academic philosopher for my entire uh, adult life. Uh, th that's what I do. Uh, Perfect. Yeah. yeah. And and like what happened that you uh, changed your interests so much um, because you became a crucial voice in the Bitcoin space and are spending a lot of time on that. Is it possible because, because you suddenly became Bitcoin rich or what's the reason behind uh, your change of interest? In that? <laughs> I, I wish uh, I wish I I am not rich, uh, Bitcoin rich or otherwise. Uh, my interest in Bitcoin is actually philosophical, and it was from the start. I discovered Bitcoin in 2011. It, I was interested in, uh, in part because I taught at these elite universities where my students went on to work for Wall Street, something I didn't grow up knowing about. I was interested in the monetary system, the financial system, and really whether it was fair, whether it was just, and I, I, I suspected it was not just and the more i learned about the system the more unjust i found it to be uh, bitcoin was was simply the last of many sort of ideas that i investigated including e-gold you know including gold itself uh, as alternatives to the monetary system we live in uh, you know not not as a part of my official philosophical work but you know i'm a curious person i saw yeah i saw my students uh, best and brightest, all going to a few firms on Wall Street. And when I tried to figure out what they did, I didn't understand how that industry was really adding value. And then, of course, I saw the industry collapse in 2008. I saw it rescued. Uh, I saw the people who put the entire financial system at risk rewarded. And then I realized that wasn't really out of the ordinary, but the whole system was designed to reward a few. Uh, yeah. Anyway, I, that, that was the beginning of my journey when Bitcoin came along and I discovered it in 2011. It, f it was the missing piece in a puzzle that I was already putting together. And I was anonymous at that point in 2011. I was also concerned about Bitcoin's impact on the environment. That early was, uh, on? That early yeah. on? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mined for a couple months before I realized that uh, if Bitcoin's market cap reached the price of gold back then, uh, it would use tremendous amounts of energy. And yeah, a part of the reason I moved to this college and Portland, Oregon, was my, my commitment to the environment. Portland is a place I could live without a car and bike around. And, you know, in Europe, there are many cities where you can do that, but not many cities you can do that in America. Portland was one of them. And... Um, so yeah, I was living car free. I was vegetarian for a decade. I was vegan uh, for part of that time until my body just said no. <laughs> I didn't handle veganism very well, but anyway, I was I was I was uh, you know donating to causes, but also active in helping people at my college think about their investments and whether they were ethically aligned with sustainability commitments of the college. So I came to see Bitcoin as actually. A powerful tool for monetary justice, but also a threat to the environment. And I found myself in that awkward spot. 
And uh, so while I was, yeah, I was excited by the idea and I was vigorously participating in debates online from 2011, always anonymously, I was also torn about its potential success. I realized it wasn't impacting the environment, but it would if it really achieved its true potential. That's kind of where I was back in 2011. And that was enough to make me stop mining and gave my mine, mining machines away. Uh, they were basically high-end gaming machines. I gave them away to a local nonprofit All right. at the time. If I had and held them, I would be rich. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, but I heard you bought some alpaca socks from that. And uh, yeah, so you have really- Yes, I bought alpaca, alpaca socks. socks for five Bitcoins yeah. a piece, a couple <laughs> dozen pairs. And uh, I made many other uh, small scale purchases, uh, like I bought things on like the Bitcoin equivalent of eBay, handmade goods, jam and jelly. Like there were very few things you could buy. I wasn't into drugs. You could buy drugs back then, but not a drug user really. So that wasn't my thing. Uh, uh, but I tried to support the circular economy. And let me just... For your, for your listeners who are maybe philosophers who don't understand why this would be something worthwhile, let me just try to say you know, a, a word about what Bitcoin is and why it would make for a more just system. I think of Bitcoin in terms of two crucial functions. Uh, it allows people, anyone who's got an internet connection, to send value to anyone else in the world who has an internet connection. So it's a, it's a network for sending value. And that network is not controlled by a central party, but it's decentralized and permissionless and censorship resistant and pseudonymous. So basically it's peer-to-peer -peer money, as, as Satoshi says in the white paper, allows you to send value peer-to-peer -peer without interference directly. And the other thing that it does, the other function, is that it allows you to store wealth in a way that is non-debasable. There's a fixed amount of Bitcoin. It increases on a fixed schedule. Everybody knows that schedule. It's public. It's shared. Uh, it was set up by the creator of Bitcoin. Satoshi Nakamoto it has never been changed. And that sort of allows you to have recourse to a savings device that cannot be debased by a money printer. And these are really two features that Bitcoin has, and you would think, might think that's no big deal. But those two features are features that no other monetary system has. And they also represent how money gets abused by central banks and governments around the world. Central banks and governments can stop payments, can keep people out of the financial system, can spy on people who are making transactions or sending value, right? They kind of prohibit and police the sending of value. And also they charge rent on it, right? They charge fees on it that are exorbitant along the way. So those are ways to abuse the users of the monetary system around the world. And the other way of abusing monetary users is to continually print money and devalue people's um, savings, the savings of their labor. And we're starting to see that in the recent inflationary uh, crisis. It's a reality for billions of people around the world and hundreds of governments uh, that their their money is inflate is inflating at ex ex exorbitant rates, uh, ma making people's lives difficult. So, so basically, it's a it's a complement to the failings of our money. Which is not to say it's great money. It's not to say it does everything well, but it does the things well that fiat monies do not do well in serving ordinary people that's that's great put thanks yeah and um but you like many people now come and say well but bitcoin mining uh this wasteful unuseful thing uses too much energy what would you say to this kind of statement it does use energy it uses a, a substantial amount of energy uh, right now it uses 0.15% of all primary energy. Whether that's a lot or a little is in the eye of the beholder, depending on whether you think that the functions that Bitcoin is providing to humanity, an open monetary network, 
that serves tens of millions of people, potentially billions of people, you know, is that worth a little over a thousandth of all energy? I think it is. Other people disagree. But more importantly, the question of how much energy Bitcoin uses is really the wrong question to be asking. Uh, energy use is not a bad thing. It's not harmful to the environment. It doesn't really have a downside uh, per se. Some energy use does and some does not. And this is a you know fundamental insight that took me a long time to have as well. Uh, Bitcoin is a very unique consumer of energy. In fact, it's totally unique. There's nothing like it. It, uh, first of all, uh, mining is the system that secures the network. It's also distributed around the world. It uses energy to secure the network so that if someone captured 51% of the total computing power of the network, they could wreak havoc on the, on the network itself. They could attack it. And therefore, the more energy spent in the service of protecting the network, the more secure it is. Uh, but how is that energy produced? If that energy comes from burning coal and generating electricity to, to run Bitcoin miners, it's very harmful to the environment and to human health. Uh, coal is a dirty source of energy. Uh, gas, less so, natural gas, but still uh, it, it it's a polluting form of energy consumption. Other forms of energy consumption, however, are not necessarily polluting. And, and here you can think about wind and solar and hydro, but even those have a footprint of a sort uh, but but a lot of the energy consumed from wind, solar, hydro uh, is actually, uh, by, by the Bitcoin mining network, is actually waste energy. So uh, we have Bitcoin miners around the world competing to mine a limited amount of Bitcoin every day, 900 Bitcoin per day right now. And uh, that competition is perfect, driving miners to the cheapest s sources of energy. The cheapest sources of energy are not only renewable, like wind, hydro, solar, but also they are the production of that energy that is least needed in time or in space. So <clears throat> Bitcoin miners don't, they produce wealth basically out of electricity at the same rate at any time and at any place around the world. They're location agnostic, time agnostic consumers of energy, scalable and portable. So what happens is, uh, you might have a solar farm that is curtailing 20% uh, of their power. Bitcoin miner can come into that location, soak up basically that 20% of excess power and pay a very minimal fee to the, to the generator. And that's using energy, but it's actually providing a payment to the solar producer that they otherwise wouldn't get. So basically making waste solar profitable where it wasn't profitable. Now that's energy use, but it's not bad for the environment. In fact, it's good because suddenly solar is now profitable and it speeds our transition to renewables. So using curtailed energy is one form of energy use that's good for the environment, actually good for the environment. Uh, another form of energy use that's good for the environment is burning waste methane. Uh, methane is the cause of up to one third of all warming. It's 84 times as warming of a, of a, uh, a greenhouse gas as CO2 over a 20 year period. And when uh, Bitcoin miners go to remote locations where methane is escaping, like let's say a landfill, uh, methane is escaping to the atmosphere and capture that methane, burn it. They do produce CO2 in that process but they've made an 84-fold reduction over a shorter period of time and a 25-fold reduction over a longer 100-year period of time uh, in greenhouse gas uh, warming potential, right? So using vented methane to power the mining network is energy use, but it is net CO2 equivalent negative in its warming impact, right? So... These two kinds of forms of energy use, and this is just to scratch the surface, but it'll give you an idea of the rabbit hole that I've been down. These two forms of energy consumption could drive up 
Bitcoin's energy use, uh, but could be a net positive for the environment. And uh, yeah, the picture gets the picture gets more complicated, but that's the gist of it, right? Does it use energy? Yes, 0.15% of energy roughly right now of, of the world's energy. Uh, is that bad? Well, it, not per se. That energy use could be good or bad from an environmental perspective, depending on the form it takes. And there are positive forms of energy consumption for the environment. Yeah, so so this was was uh, uh, this is what actually struck me so much when when I uh, sit down and read all your posts and also your uh, heard your talks um, is that you're like not just debunking why Bitcoin is bad for the environment. You're actually saying it has some good po like an upside for the environment, and um, that's really counterintuitive if you begin to um, yeah. If you begin to read about this space, if you begin to read about Bitcoin, um, and and I try to make this point a lot of times, but then there's this next thing. So we said, okay, Bitcoin is not useless. It has um, it's justified to use energy at all, so it's not waste it, itself. Then we say, okay, it's not even it's it, it's the most efficient energy user out there. Uh, it needs to it needs to find the cheapest and uh, most sustainable energy source to survive in the long in the long run, and so we we got these two check checks and then uh, the last point might be an argument many people bring well but it takes away the like the energy Bitcoin finds why don't we use it for other house like for households for other use cases what do you say to that like why can't we use this creativity from the Bitcoin space um, to create energy for yeah everyday life. I, I think in short, Bitcoin will be a part of creating energy use for everyday life, and is. Uh, I, I, I think. Uh, let's go back to the observation. I'm sorry, I've moved a little bit quickly. It's difficult to break this down quickly. Uh, as you say, Bitcoin mining is a perfectly competitive market meaning every Bitcoin miner is engaged in exactly the same activity. They're taking electricity in and they get Bitcoin out at the same rate because they're running the same machines. So in order to be profitable, you and, and the thing they get out is identical. All Bitcoin producers produce this fungible good that is instantly shipped around the world through the Internet, so, so to speak. Uh, nothing distinguishes Bitcoin produced in one place from Bitcoin produced in another. So it's perfectly competitive, meaning if you can find cheaper power somewhere in the world, your costs go below other producers and the margins of Bitcoin mining keep shrinking so that you will eventually push other miners out of business. Right? So that's the basic mechanism is a perfect market, most perfect market that's ever been in existence as closest to an economics textbook example of a perfect market because it's a digital uh, fungible good that's input is just electricity. So that means the price sensitivity is extreme. Uh, right now, in order to profitably mine Bitcoin, you need to be under five cents per kilowatt hour in your electricity cost. And it's probably lower than that. It's more like four cents a kilowatt hour. And in order to, and very soon, that's going to be dropping even further, right? It's going to go down easily to two cents or one and a half cents a kilowatt hour in the very near future, given that the total network power is really rising fast. And yet the reward remains exactly the same. So what does that mean when you cannot make money mining on anything but two, three cents a kilowatt hour power? Well, that's way less than retail consumers pay, right? Retail rates everywhere, everywhere are higher than that. They're very often subsidized and still much higher than that. In fact, commercial rates are higher than that. Where can you get power that's less than five cents a kilowatt hour? Basically, only in places where there is no demand for power that's competing with you. You cannot get those rates outside of New York City or Los Angeles or Berlin or any, anywhere in you know, any large city in the world or any city in, uh, in Europe that's not, say, 
300, 400 Ks north of, uh, you know, where, where's, where's mining happening in Europe? Remote hydro in northern Norway. Uh, it's several hundred miles north of, uh, of Oslo and not sufficiently connected by the grid. Right now, miners in that location are paying 1.5 cents, uh, euro cents per kilowatt hour. That's the rate they're paying. Ask people in Oslo what, what they pay for electricity. It's very expensive. Right now we're in an energy crisis, right? So this is true worldwide. Anywhere you're feeling a crunch on energy, Bitcoin miners will not be there because that crunch, that same crunch would make their business unprofitable. So this is an incredible consumer of energy that only can survive on the cheapest forms of energy worldwide, meaning it should never contribute to an energy crisis. And yet at the same time, its consumption of energy is paid. And that paying for energy uh, subsidizes the build out of energy production that is very cheap. It doesn't subsidize it a lot because they're only paying, you know, they're only going to pay one, two cents a kilowatt hour, but it's more than zero. And uh, so, so you have to ask, well, what forms of energy can produce power at, at those very, very cheap rates? And we're just fortunate right now that solar is the cheapest form of new energy production. It's actually now cheaper. And of course, this varies by region. It's cheaper to produce energy with solar and build a whole new solar plant than it is simply to run gas plants uh, 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 in general. This is analysis by Lazard, like the, the marginal cost of running a gas plant, not even considering its infrastructure, is more than building out new solar. And the same goes for coal. Coal is even more expensive than gas, right? So the cheapest power is going to be renewable energy, nuclear, if they ever get their act together. Uh, nuclear has had a hard time delivering on their promises, but potentially it could be very cheap power. And Bitcoin pairs very well with nuclear. Uh, so Bitcoin will help to provide a base rate buyer of, of this super cheap power, uh, adding to their profitability without adding to anybody's utility bill. That's kind of the, the magic of Bitcoin as a consumer. It will never compete with, uh, with retail Unless we happen to be in a moment where uh, the mining machines are in short supply, the price of Bitcoin has run up tremendously, and that did in fact happen two years ago. And we did have Bitcoin miners moving to certain communities, like in upstate New York, you know, en masse, when mining was banned in China, we had a moment in time where suddenly it was profitable to mine Bitcoin on any priced energy whatsoever, and we had certain instances of Bitcoin miners keeping coal plants open that would otherwise have been closed, keeping gas plants open that would otherwise have been closed, and driving up local utility rates, basically because mining fled to America from China, where half of mining was at the time during a bull run. In that one moment, Bitcoin mining did drive up utility rates locally. It also did keep fossil plants from being retired. And so Bitcoin has that potential and uh, in those rare moments. But its true nature, its long-term trend is to go to only the cheapest power, to be non-rival as a consumer, and to consume and to run on renewable and low-carbon forms of energy production and to monetize waste energy. And that's what we're seeing now, right? So I think the world is confused about Bitcoin's energy profile. Precisely mm -hmm. because it took a snapshot of what Bitcoin was doing at one moment in time, and then it generalized that forward. Uh, yeah, and, and that, it, that's also what I what I wanted to ask you is basically uh, the long term tendency. You kind of also already described it, but so here's a statement also, uh, which is often claimed: um, the more uh, Bitcoin gets adopted, and the bigger, yeah, the bigger the uh, the higher the prices the higher energy consumption will be. So kind of your um, assumption you had in 2011 that it's basically never going to stop in energy consumption. Um, and uh, I kind of feel it, it uh, leaves or, or it forgets that there is an adjustment of difficulty and all that kind of stuff. But I wonder, like, how would you answer to this claim? Yeah, well, first of all, 
when price goes up, there is more incentive to mine. That's true. And um, a very fast run up in price will create more mining. And we saw that. And we have seen that throughout Bitcoin's history. Um, but as you say, there's this thing called, um, well, there's the difficulty adjustment, but there's this thing called the halving. Uh, Bitcoin's issuance schedule uh, it goes like this. New Bitcoin are awarded to miners uh, every roughly 10 minutes when a new block is added, a new entry to the shared distributed ledger of Bitcoin. And along with each block, uh, the, the winning miner is awarded a block subsidy. When Bitcoin was first created, that block subsidy was 50 Bitcoin per block, 50 Bitcoin every 10 minutes. That's when I was mining. And that's when I did those calculations. 50 new Bitcoin were issued every 10 minutes. Uh, Bitcoin's issuance schedule halves every four years. So four years after the protocol was introduced, uh, the block reward dropped from 50 to 25 per, per 25 Bitcoin awarded per 10 minutes. Then it dropped to 12.5. And then it dropped again to 6.25. That's the epoch we're in. And soon it will drop to 3.125. Uh, and so it'll go from 900 Bitcoin a day to 450 per day. This is the schedule of Bitcoin's issuance, having every four years. And 99%, 98 to 99% of all Bitcoin miner income is from that block subsidy. The remaining 1% to 2% is from fees. It's negligible at this point. So basically, Bitcoin's rewards for miners worldwide in Bitcoin terms are designed to drop at this exponential rate. In order for Bitcoin mining incentive to increase, Bitcoin's price has to double every four years and then some, right? We need to, the price needs to rise at a rate of more than doubling every four years. And in fact, the history of Bitcoin's prices, it has more than doubled every four years, which is why the incentive to miners has grown. And it's an extraordinary growth rate. But how long can a growth rate like that continue? Uh, not that much longer, actually. Uh, if, you, if you think about doubling <laughs> the price of Bitcoin uh, every, every four years, just doubling, which would mean keeping the, the amount of incentive to consume energy the same, uh, uh, you very quickly hit the total supply of all money in the world. Right? It's something like 20... Uh, you know, 25 years, 26 years, we will be at the, if we, if we continue on that rate of growth in price, Bitcoin's value would equal the mon the value of all money in the world. So <laughs> there's not that much of a ceiling. People, first of all, don't do that math. Uh, but, but also the other thing that's misleading about that is uh, that I think Bitcoin's energy use will continue to grow even as the block reward, the block subsidy going to miners drops. So we have our energy budget, and then we have how much energy we're getting with that budget. And I think that the energy budget, even if price doesn't grow, even if the energy budget shrinks, the energy that we consume with that same budget is going to grow. Because Bitcoin miners are basically seeking out and finding cheap energy around the world. So they're paying less and less with for their energy. Like two years ago, probably the average amount being paid for energy was probably 10 cents a kilowatt hour, just given that people were plugging in everywhere. Now it's four. And in two more years, it's going to be two. And after that, it'll be one. And a decade from now, it's going to be very close to zero. Something else that we're seeing in Bitcoin mining is Bitcoin miners turn energy into heat. Ultimately, the energy coming into a Bitcoin miner in the form of electricity is conserved. It doesn't go anywhere. Uh, it just becomes a, a different form of energy, a less useful form, low-grade heat. And Bitcoin miners are using that heat. They're actually selling that heat. Uh, the large ones, you can use it to heat your house. Some of, the, some of the large miners are using that energy for different industrial processes uh, in, let's say, paper mills or in drying timber uh, or in fermentation. Some are using them to heat greenhouses, to grow flowers, to grow food in Northern Europe, uh, but <clears throat> also district heating. Uh, 
Uh, but more and more, we're going to find uses of low-grade heat. And if you are getting money for your heat, then you can actually spend more than a Bitcoin to mine one Bitcoin because you're also getting paid in heat. So you're still profitable, right? You're getting paid for your and heat. Yeah, and that's what we have right now. I mean, it's the first time in Europe that we are struggling with the costs of heat and like in also electricity. But uh, it's the first time I, I feel we have the opportunity to understand the adaptability of Bitcoin in everyday use cases. Yeah. Exactly. It, it when it comes to electrical heating, the uh, even though all the energy is conserved in Bitcoin Miner, it's still not the most efficient heater. It's a resistance heater. It's not a heat pump. But in very cold weather, uh, heat pumps are insufficient and uh, they can be used in a complementary fashion with resistance heaters. What's important is that it's electrification, right? If you don't have gas, but, but you, or gas is very expensive, but you have electricity because your electricity is being generated with offshore wind or nuclear or uh, other, other forms of renewable or low carbon energy, then if you, you know, heat is one of the major consumers of fossil fuels. If you switch from that to electricity and your mix is better than 100% fossil, right, you're making a net benefit. And if you're using with heat pumps, even better. Heat pumps are also a lot of, a lot of capital expenditure to install, right? So I see Bitcoin heating as really an important shift in its role. But now imagine if you have Bitcoin heating everywhere we have low-grade electrical industrial heat and we're using with heat pumps and so on, then Bitcoin will use a ton of energy because essentially it'll use the energy that we are right now using for resistance heating. That's way more energy than the Bitcoin mining network uses. Heating is, is a large percentage of energy use overall. So I'd see Bitcoin's energy use just going sky high. But the budget for energy for Bitcoin energy in Bitcoin terms, be very small. And also the emissions profile along with that energy use, very small because it's simply substituting for existing heating. So it's net decarbonizing, right? Again, coming back to the question of energy and emissions, we, I see a future where Bitcoin's energy use is extraordinary, but it is not adding to anybody's bill. It is not contributing to carbon emissions. In fact, it's net carbon negative. It's substituting for fossil heating. It's substituting for other forms of electrical heating. Uh, it's monetizing. Uh, it's monetizing new renewable energy and speeding the transition to renewables, and contributing to the electrification of the economy. Right. So uh, <laughs> that's that's the fundamental fallacy: confusing emissions and energy. And this is just yet another example of how I see those two coming apart. Awesome. Like, Troy, that's like so on point, in my opinion, I could really follow along. And I, I think you made a really good point in, in summarizing these things, these topics. So I really hope that kind of gives the audience a better understanding of how it works. Um, what, and if they're interested, uh, I re re really recommend them to uh, check out the, your podcast with Peter McCormack about the, how Bitcoin is good for the environment. You, you are explaining your idea. Um, really well there, I, I think, about how Bitcoin can also, you know, like the longer version of what we just got, basically. And um, yeah, but I so so for the end of the interview, I, I kind of wanted to give you the space also for maybe add something to your idea of how Bitcoin can be good for the environment if you haven't said uh, everything yet. And if not, then maybe also the new idea of uh, what what you kind of uh, yeah came came along on the Bitcoin Pacific uh, conference. Yeah. Well, I heard you let me that. just say, yeah, I've I haven't quite said yet how Bitcoin mining could be, or why I think it could be a net good. I've said that you know heating could be replaced by mining. I've said that it could it could uh, incentivize the build out of renewable energy and help make renewables profitable. And I've said that it can help us deal with waste methane, right? But I, as a point that I made on, on Peter's podcast and that I should make here is that right now, Bitcoin is just too small to actually make a meaningful difference in either direction, really, in the negative or in the positive direction. On the negative side, Cambridge estimates that Bitcoin right now is responsible for 0.09% of warming emissions. 
which is you know a, a negative impact on the environment, but it's really small. It's less than a thousandth of uh, emissions. And of course, it's substituting for uh, the legacy financial system, which has its own impacts. It's substituting for equities, which are more carbon intensive uh, by, uh, by unit value. What, what we need to see in the future is for Bitcoin mining to be a much bigger operation in order to have a positive impact that's meaningful. I mean, the subsidies of of to solar in California alone are much, much larger than the entire Bitcoin mining uh, industry, right? Much larger than the whole industry, just at one state subsidies alone. So it's, it's really not enough to make a meaningful difference in either direction. It, it needs to be much bigger. And the idea that uh, I had it developed with Andrew Bailey about how to how to uh, accelerate the process of growing Bitcoin mining and its impact for good. Right now, its impact is probably net negative on the environment, although very small. It's trending in this positive direction. How do we get it to trend there faster? And how do we get it to scale to the size needed to make a positive and meaningful difference? Uh, and there, um, you know, we proposed a formula, which is how to hold Bitcoin in a net carbon negative, carbon neutral, carbon negative way. And that is, if you hold Bitcoin, uh, a certain percentage of all Bitcoin, let's say 0.01% of all Bitcoin, the, our prescription is you should do 0.01% of all mining. Your, your contribution to the Bitcoin mining network should equal your ownership of Bitcoin, the asset, at least equal. And that contribution to hash rate should be in socially positive and carbon neutral or negative ways. If you are uh, doing some mining on waste methane, you are net carbon negative. And if you do enough of that, it offsets the incentive that you are giving to miners worldwide with the Bitcoin that you hold. Yes, that idea, uh, Andrew and I present in a paper that's available on on uh, Andrew's site, resistance.money slash green. Uh, resistance.money slash green is where you can read that idea. So yeah, to, to step back, I think Bitcoin needs to grow as an asset and as a network in order to make a meaningful difference. It also needs to achieve its final form sooner rather than later. And I think we can play a role. Bitcoin is not just an open source protocol. We're a part of a community. Why did I get involved? Because Bitcoin isn't a company, it's not a corporation, there is no CEO, because it's just us. And I've known this since 2011. It's open source protocol that you can run in your machine, but it's also a community of people that are shaping the future of that code and its implementation in the world. Bitcoin is a community. It is an open, permissionless community, but it's still a community. And if you want to shape Bitcoin, you can present your idea for its future and then advocate for it. And that's what I did. Uh, entered the space. I had an idea. I'm advocating for it. But I'm also putting my money where my mouth is in trying to mine myself and get others who share my values to also mine in their way. This Bitcoin isn't something you just have to watch from the outside, like everything else in this world, and just say, oh, my God, the world is going to hell. You know, oh, my God, the, the, the environment's being destroyed. Oh, my God. Large corporations are polluting and they're, you know, extracting value from the global south and whatever, continuing the legacy of colonial. We don't have to do that with Bitcoin. We are Bitcoin. That's the difference. You're a part of this monetary network. You're a part of the mining network if you want to be. If you see something you want changed, just enter and make a difference. Make a difference yourself. And so that's my message was just like, we don't have to sit here passively and watch mining uh, go in a direction we don't want it to go. It's a free and permissionless activity. Anybody can buy an ASIC. Anybody can plug it in. And, you know, there are so many, uh, you know, European Bitcoiners plugging in miners as heaters, running them on their own home solar, right? And when they do that, they add to hash rate and they get some of that limited 900 Bitcoin per day, making yeah. it more expensive and harder for people to mine on other four sources of energy. And that is beautiful. That is my idea, right? This is a That's, network that we yeah. own. Let's make it yeah. what we want it to be. That's so great.
I mean, one practical question I have here is that, that you could claim, well, it's so expensive to get the infrastructure of an ASIC. You, to, to buy the S19 costs now around, I think, uh, 5,000 euros or something, maybe less or more. How much? More like 2,500. It really, I, I, it was so, so much cheaper because of the uh, uh, dip. The price of Bitcoin dropping and the hash rate rising has made ASICs cheaper, which is great because uh, yeah. that means that in the operating, in the budget of mining, you don't have to have as much uptime for your machine in order to be profitable because you have less depreciation. Instead, mm -hmm. your most important input is energy. Energy cost is now the most important input, not hardware cost, not CapEx, it's OpEx. So it, but it, you're still it, right. Yeah. It's still expensive and S19s are yeah. difficult to run. They're loud. Uh, they're not, it's not easy to mine at home with a latest gen machine. And so I have been working on how to mine your values, we call it, without owning a machine in your home. And there are a couple of ways to do it. One is hosted mining with the right kind of hosting. I am working with a company, uh, SAS Mining, that is you know, go going to mine exclusively on Renewable. They're about to open their first facility. Of course, it's a very difficult time to be running a mining company, but they're about to open their first facility um, on hy hydro, small hydro in the Midwest of the US. Uh, so one thing you could do is buy a machine and have it hosted by someone else, have it run by someone else, and you give them a share of the profits for doing it. Uh, as we all know, that's dicey. You have to do your own research because you don't have your own machine. Uh, but the other thing I'm working on is a hash rate product where you essentially buy the right to a certain amount of Bitcoin that is produced by miners that are audited, uh, you know, by a reputable third party. Uh, you, you, you have an auditor that certifies that a company has the uh, machines they claim to have, that they are being powered on the kind of energy that they are claiming uh, by in, you know inspecting their utility statements, their utility bills, basically, or that they're using heat in the way that they claim they are. So you have a third-party auditor say the hash rate is there, the, the hash power is there, the machines are there, the electricity is of the sort that they say it is, and it is certifiably green. You know, it's certifiably green and non-rival. It's not driving up power prices elsewhere. We put a cap for qualifying hash rate, we put a cap on on the price of power that they pay that ensures that they're not competing with uh, retail consumers. So basically take like the kinds of ways in which Bitcoin mining can be good and the kind of ways in which it could be bad. And you have a checklist and you verify that it's good. And then you buy the rights to all the Bitcoin produced over a certain period of time with that qualifying hash rate. That's a security. So it has to be registered as such. I, I, I'm not interested in tokenizing hash rate and selling it in an unregulated way, although that is happening worldwide. I'm not going to do that. Uh, it's a security. So I'm having to go through the channels of figuring out what, what it looks like to bring a registered security to market that does this. In both the US and Europe, I am working on it. That's all I can say is I'm working on it with a number of firms. Got it. Yeah, perfect. And, and, and as for the other two, as far as the other two yeah, ideas that exactly. I teased, yeah, exactly. uh, I, I, I don't want to jump the gun because um, I want to let uh, Peter McCormick uh, and what Bitcoin did, you know, break those two. Uh -huh. uh, I'm also I'm also interviewing myself. Uh, the two people who are running the two companies in question, let's just give it a really ambiguous tease. And let's say both yeah. of them have to do with innovative and surprising ways to make use of the mining process itself for an environmental good. One of them, and I will just, I will just tease it like this. One of them, I'll tease it like this. Okay. Uh, Bitcoin mining will be used to purify water, to make pure water. I'll leave it at that. The other idea is about ambient air carbon capture. Uh, 
you know, built into the IPCC models is that, especially after 2050, in order to bring temperatures down to, you know, 1.5, because we're going to overshoot, we are going to need to capture billions of tons of CO2 out of the atmosphere. And this has always seemed to me utterly ridiculous. It still does, actually. I'm not sure this idea even works. Uh, building massive fan banks, placing them in random locations around the world. This is also going to be a location agnostic business. Uh, powering those fan banks with electricity, blowing ambient air through an aqueous solution, which also requires heat. It's going to require a tremendous amount of energy and resources. But maybe you can think of something else that generates heat and uses large banks of fans. 90% of the cost, 90% of the cost of at least some of these kinds of carbon capture devices is blowing air, the energy <laughs> and materials to blow air. Okay, I will leave it at that. Yeah. Carbon Perfect. capture and water, yeah. pure water, yeah. Yeah. might be facilitated by Bitcoin mining. And stay tuned. It's, it's amazing. Yeah, that's uh, my whole point of this interview also to just show how Bitcoin mining incentivizes creativity in this whole energy uh, infrastructure on the world and how to make it yeah, more smarter, useful for the environment, for our energy costs, if someone thinks pragmatically about it. And yeah, I think we, we did a good conversation here, Troy. Yeah, the, the bottom line about the bottom line on, on Bitcoin as Bitcoin mining as an industry is that it is brand new technology platform for innovation. It consumes energy in a new way. Nothing has ever been this flexible as a consumer of energy. I didn't even mention this. Bitcoin miners can turn off and on in seconds, right? So important, which allows, yeah. Which allows them to balance grids. But also it means like, yeah, if the, if the power prices go up, Bitcoin miners can immediately shut off or turn down. It means that Bitcoin mining can co-locate with and be a part of other industrial processes uh, without stressing those other processes. So wherever you're using, let's say, wherever you're using heating right now, it's electrical heating that's resistance heating. We can put an ASIC in instead of that resistance resistance heater. And it doesn't have to be up all the time. It doesn't have to run all the time. It doesn't really make any demands. It can just make that form of heating cheaper. And likewise, if you are already burning off methane uh, or burning energy and just wasting it, as we are in oil fields around the world, we are burning off seven times as much energy in oil fields simply burning it, then the entire Bitcoin mining network consumes. So you can think of a Bitcoin miner as a heater that's subsidized by Bitcoin, or you can think about it as a flare stack that is subsidized by Bitcoin and very efficient, burns more efficiently than existing flare stacks, and is also cheaper because it is subsidized by the Bitcoin printed, right? When you start thinking of it that way, then the imagination you you know runs wild and you realize that we're just at the beginning moments of a technological revolution how can we improve the grid how can we build energy systems how can we improve heating systems uh by integrating this subsidy mechanism and to form any kind of strong opinion about an emerging platform for innovative technology at, at, its, at its nascent stage, at its incipient stage, would be foolish, right? You have, a, it, you have a brand new platform for innovation. How can you draw a strong negative conclusion? Oh, we should ban it. Uh, oh, it's bad for the environment. When we don't even know yet what it will look like, uh, what things will be invented on top of it. Yes, if it can help us purify water, if it can help us mitigate methane, if it can help us balance highly intermittent and unreliable grids, if it can help us monetize uh, 
forms of energy production. We didn't even talk about this. Forms of energy production that otherwise cannot be incentivized, like ocean thermal energy conversion, like deep geothermal, right? Like uh, subsidizing nuclear. Uh, the potential for integrating this technology into major and even unforeseen developments in the history of human progress with energy, uh, you know, it, 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 to me, it's uh, deeply pessimistic and absurd even to draw a to have a strong moral stance on something we don't yet even fully understand. <laughs> Right? It seems to me much more like the right attitude is one of cautious optimism to look for the good in this technology and then not only look for it, but try to develop it. Right. This is where mining your values comes in. Right. Support and push for the kinds of ways of applying this technology that are pro-social and pro-environmental. Drive out the forms that are not, not through prohibition because it's a free and open network. Prohibiting is not going to do much good, but drive them out through competition for a very limited resource. And that's basically my message. It's a great step in technological advancement of the species in how we deal with energy and money. And on both sides, we are not mere spectators. We are participants and we can shape this narrative or, or we can stand on the sidelines and complain about it, right? And I, you know, I think the choice between those two is obvious. Yeah, we, we in Bavaria, we had a king uh, in the 19th century who thought that trains are not gonna be like work out. And that's why we don't have a beautiful central station compared to other cities in Germany. <laughs> yeah. And uh, that's just like, yeah, we, you just see that revolutions are always um, accompanied by criticism, a lot of criticism. And um, I just love that we are, as humans are able to come together, talk about it, take our time as philosophers and go through each argument and think exactly. about if it makes sense or not. And it's what I'm also trying to say. That's like my message here. It can be positive. We need to think about it, why and how. It's not that it's for sure, but the potential of it is so gigantic that I also want to advocate my time and, and spend my time just on this topic now. And yeah, I mean. Yeah, and if I can say one last thing to your listeners, um, you know, I feel, feel like I've rushed it today. And this is just the surface of a, a difficult, nuanced and deep inquiry. The more I have learned about how electrical grids work, how energy systems work, even like flaring methane is a hugely complicated topic, how flares mm. work. I'm just beginning to grasp it. Um, it you know, the, the many parts of the technosphere that are touched by Bitcoin, each one of them represents, you know, decades of human ingenuity and history and, and politics. Uh, and, and I'm, I'm recognizing my ignorance as, as I touch on each one of these areas, which is exciting. But I also realize for ordinary people, you have lives to live. You know, you don't have time to go down each one of these rabbit holes. Right. Uh, but I think that's where your, your attitude is exactly right. When you don't have time to learn about the grid and, you know, learn how electricity Two thirds of it is simply wasted. Two thirds of what we produce is wasted. It's not like other scarce goods. It's it's not a simple fungible good where energy use anywhere could could be used elsewhere. Like if the if the Bitcoin mining network were to turn off today, I think electric electricity rates would definitely not go down. They would probably go up in certain places where Bitcoin miners are are helpful to the function of the grid and providing another buyer, right? And even though they are using energy, and that's counterintuitive. And there are many, many more counterintuitive discoveries uh, here. And, and given that the landscape is so specialized and difficult and complicated, I think the right attitude for an ordinary person to have is, is one of epistemic humility and caution, right? Like it's exactly the right attitude to have. Um, you know, I'm optimistic, as you are optimistic. 
Uh, I'm working with a company that does uh, methane mining on landfill gas, helps to finance uh, the capture of gases that are right now ex escaping, and then uh, runs those gases through a turbine, generates electricity. And then we'll use that electricity for other things than Bitcoin when those landfills are connected to the grid, but that might be a while, right? I think that what that company is doing, Vespine Energy, is hugely, hugely exciting. Uh, uh, but uh, one should be cautious. It, one should look at, yes, the other possibilities for using the energy. All of those are wide open questions. I think that's the ultimate lesson to, to, to take away. It's a new technology. Let's be cautious about it. Let's also be, um, let, let's also be, uh, you know, vigorous in ferreting out potential benefits for humanity with the technology as money and as a, as a, a consumer of energy and a source of revenue in, in, in all respects, let's be, let's be cautiously optimistic, epistemically humble and opportunistic about what we find to advance our own human ends. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, Troy, uh, I would say let's let's make it an end here for the interview. Thanks a lot. Um, I think it's going to be helpful, I hope. Thank you yeah. so much. I, I feel like we came around and ended strong. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> definitely. Um, yeah, I, we'll have to talk more make, on the philosophy yeah. side another time, right? Yeah, I mean, exactly. Like, like, that's another thing, you know, like, how does Bitcoin and philosophy match and, and wh where, where can we find philosophical questions? I mean, for me, it's, it's really this whole topic of eth like ethical questions. Money and ethics are so closely related when it comes to real life um, examples. Um, then, then I really think um, it's just an uh, object of research for philosophy. It's not necessarily ethical itself, Bitcoin, or, you know, as many things are not ethical themselves. They're just like an object of ethics. And uh, agree. I agree. Think, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. I think Bitcoin is, uh, uh, yes, an object of ethical study. Exactly. Uh, we're we're going to have questions about, you know, how we should relate to Bitcoin in similar ways to how we should relate to other monetary instruments right uh how should we uh tax it how should we uh regulate it how, how should we you know sh sh should we adopt it should we uh issue adoption those are all vital ethical questions exactly. I, I i i agree entirely I, and i think yeah. some of what's most most val i'm teaching a class on philosophy of money in the spring and some of what's most valuable about Bitcoin is actually just providing a lens to ask those very same questions about regular fiat money. Um, yeah. You can use it, you know. You know, I think of I think of fiat money as a kind of crypto with its own issuance schedule, philosophy, its own sort of mechanism of governance, and it's an easier way for me to think about money than than the standard. Than the standard textbook way of thinking about money and and what's right or wrong right you're like well should uh -huh. should governance be done by a board of governors who are representatives of the banking industry or should it be done by people who run a 200 hundred dollar node around the world <laughs> you know uh who, who should who should be in charge and how should that go and that, that yeah bitcoin actually helps me ask those questions in a more fruitful way <laughs>